I'm Anastasia Moroso, and this is Beyond 6040. On this show, we do a deep dive into the alternative investment space, share industry leader insights, and discuss the latest innovations in technology. Today, we'll start with my market poll snapshot, and I'll share the one thing that caught my attention this week in private markets. Next, Hugh McDonald of Clarion Partners and Mike Comparado of Benefit Street Partners join me at the desk to talk about the equity and debt side of real estate investing. And then, in the spirit of Women's History Month, I'm happy to have iCapital Managing Director of Private Wealth Solutions, Corinne Salmon, help me answer your question of the month. Let's get to it. In today's Market Pulse snapshot, the one thing I'm focused on in private markets is the increasing need for private commercial real estate debt, given the pullback in regional bank lending. In fact, this week marks exactly a year since the collapse of Silicon Valley Bank, which was then followed by additional failures of Signature Bank and First Republic. These failures caused concerns about the state of regional banks and the negative impact it could have on commercial real estate lending broadly. Now, regional banks, of course, hold two-thirds of the outstanding CRE loans, and as those mature, it's not clear that this sector will continue to be the lender to the CRE market that it once was. Indeed, looking at the recent data, we see that banks have been pulling back on CRE lending. The growth rate for commercial real estate loans for all banks is still positive, plus 1.1% as of the fourth quarter of 2023, but it is down significantly from the peak of 13.4% in the third quarter of 2022. In volume terms, if we look at the quarterly CRE lending pace, it has been running at a much lower pace in 2023 than in the prior two years, as you can see in this chart. If this continues, it poses a risk that the banks may not be willing to refinance a record wall of upcoming CRE maturities. Indeed, there's approximately $5.8 trillion in outstanding CRE debt, with roughly a trillion dollars maturing this year and next. And given this weaker lending backdrop from the banks that we just discussed, those borrowers with upcoming maturities may need to look elsewhere for that funding. Now, fortunately, private commercial real estate debt funds have been eager to step in and provide capital because they're also looking at higher rates and wider spreads. For example, new issuances of senior CRE mortgages carry a coupon rate of SOFR, which is a floating rate, plus a 400 basis point spread, so yielding a total of 9% coupon at these rates on these loans. And CRE debt funds, assets under management, have grown to $270 billion as of June of 2023, up from $258 billion as of December of 2022, and up significantly from a decade ago. Now, these real estate debt funds are sitting on also a near record $77 billion in dry powder. And by the way, this is in addition to the commercial real estate equity funds, which hold $1.4 trillion in AUM with $470 billion in dry powder as of June of 2023. And those funds may be willing to step in and invest in equity in properties where prices have already sufficiently reset. So, while investors are absolutely right to worry about this funding gap for commercial real estate loans, given the regional bank pullback, and especially in the office sector, the good news is that private commercial real estate funds should be able to step in and help alleviate part of this funding gap, together with the other institutional pools of capital, such as sovereign wealth funds. And that's your one thing in private markets this week. But for more on this very important topic of refinancing the upcoming CRE maturities, be sure to check out our next segment, where I sit down with two real estate experts on the debt and equity side of the equation, and I ask exactly how and where they are stepping in given this backdrop. Take a look. My guests today are Hugh McDonnell and Mike Comparado. Hugh is the head of client capital management and Clarion Partners, and Mike is the head of commercial real estate at Benefit Street Partners. Both are subsidiaries of Franklin Templeton. With 1.4 trillion in total assets under management, Franklin Templeton is one of the world's largest independent investment managers. So today we're gonna to be talking about private real estate investing from both sides of the equation, equity with Hugh uh, and the debt side with Mike. 
Uh, so, gentlemen, welcome. Thank Thanks you. for joining us Thank today, you uh, Hugh and Mike. And Hugh, maybe I'll start with you. And of course, you focus on equity investing, and Clarion has a 40-year history uh, of that. And it's one of the largest pure play real estate investment managers with over $75 billion uh, in assets under management. So you have excellent perspective, both of you do, on the state of the commercial real estate. And so that's where I want to start. Because if I look at some of the price charts for the corrections in commercial real estate, um, the index is down 16% from the peak in price appreciation terms or depreciation terms since the peak in the second quarter of 2022. And when I last looked at the chart about a quarter ago, that number was 11. So it seems like the returns still continue to be negative. But where are we uh, with the state of commercial real estate? When might we see a turning point? Well. Uh, thanks, Anastasia. 2023 has obviously been a super complicated year for commercial real estate broadly. The significant movement in the Fed created a lot of volatility in the market, affected you know the pricing of core and other forms of real estate. So been a very, very complicated year. Um, I think the outlook going forward is much different, both on the equity side and on the debt side, right? But net net, do you think you see more opportunity in commercial real estate given the correction, or do you think the risks are still lurking? We're definitely at the beginning of a new part of the real estate cycle. Is overall um, there's overall more opportunity, and we're excited about that opportunity for sure. Again, there are risks and places that risk will create opportunities in capital structure, but overall the outlook is, is very good. Remember, private real estate has performed very well over a very long time period in portfolios. So it has uh, delivered exactly what it was supposed to deliver. Good returns, eight to 9% over long time periods, low correlations to equity and debt. Uh, low volatility. So all of those good factors about private real estate, we're about to see a gain as, the, as we head into the next part of the real estate cycle. All right. Well, let's take the other perspective on that from the debt side of the equation. And so, uh, Mike, from your perspective, where are we in terms of this commercial real estate cycle? Um, you know, what kind of opportunities is this creating to be a debt uh, a lender in this space? Yeah, well, thank you again, Anastasia, for having us. Um, I think picking bottoms is a very dangerous game, but I do think that if we're not at the bottom, we're very close. Uh, I think it's a, a little bit more difficult in the office sector. Uh, what we're seeing in the office sector is a fair, fairly apocalyptic uh, correction. That's uh, more like a 27% correction, by the way, not I, the 16 I referenced. And I think that's more. probably right. conservative, would be my guess. I think it's probably meaningfully more than that. Um, I think commercial real estate has really gone through a phase right now of there's office and then there's everything else. Um, but it's it's been a very difficult time. But what it has produced on the credit side of things is really a dislocation in the credit market given how heavily the banks, how heavy a role the banks play in commercial real estate credit. Uh, they represent about half the market. It's about a $6 trillion market. Banks have about $3 trillion of that. And they are largely on the sidelines. They have not been lending for the past 12 months. So. Uh, we are taking advantage of the banks being on the sidelines. We're taking advantage of the mortgage REITs, publicly traded mortgage REITs being on the sidelines. And we're achieving what we believe to be some of the best risk adjusted returns in the lending space that we've had since the GFC. Right. And you brought up the GFC, but there's another banking crisis we should talk about. And by the way, as we sit here this week, it's a one year anniversary of the unfortunate collapse of Silicon Valley Bank. And we've got New York Community Bank that is also in the headlines as well. So are those one offs? Uh, is there a broader crisis to be thinking about and um, that can derail commercial real estate? I don't think we can derail commercial real estate. I do think we are in the throes of a banking crisis. Uh, I think it's probably more uh, touching more the community bank and regional bank sector than it is the large money center banks. Uh, but they, they haven't been lending for a year and that's not because things are good at the bank. Uh, remember, commercial real estate mortgages are non mark to market assets. I think if you had to mark a lot of their paper to market, you could have hundreds of insolvent banks, but they're mm. they're hoarding their cash. They're going to try to fix their problems before they start actively lending again. And, and I think it could take a few years before we see that happen. So, Mike, everybody knows it, but Hugh, if everybody knows this, and you know, Mike paints, I think, a realistic but also a bit of a pessimistic, um, you know, state of um, of the banking crisis. But how does this end? How does this end for the commercial real estate investor? The fundamentals in commercial real estate 
at the, at the asset level are actually pretty good in all of the sectors or most of the sectors. And that's when we look at vacancy office. rates and... Right, by fundamentals rate, vacancy rates, um, uh, occupancy, vacancy, rental rates, et cetera. So uh, the fundamentals are actually really good in all sectors apart from office. The pandemic taught the world how to work from home and that has changed how people think about working in an office environment. And today we see, the, this, what we see today is when people are taking space, they're taking 15 to 20% less space. That has the apocalyptic, to use Mike's term, <laughs> um, uh, impact on, on office demand. So let's put office to the side for a minute and the rest of the sectors are really good. And by the way, office, which used to be 30 to 40% of portfolios, is now like 15 to 20% of portfolios. Mm -hmm. So it's becoming a much smaller part of institutional investors' portfolios. Industrial warehouses is has had a terrific performance run over the past decade and is projected to continue. Housing has a, has a, a very significant positive outlook. There's a significant shortage in housing in the United States, three to five million units that's spread across different formats from manufactured to student to traditional to high rise to senior, right? There's a shortage of housing and that's a big tailwind. And then other sectors, things that people don't often think about almost mm -hmm. as real estate sectors, things like storage, self storage units, which have traditionally been a part of the public domain, but not the private domain. Those are increasingly becoming institutional and the outlook for all of those sectors on a go forward basis is really, really good. All right. So um, more about office, but I think we understand that the profile of office is quite different. And so that's why, Hugh, you're focusing on things like storage and housing and warehousing and some of the more alternative uh, sectors, subsectors. Uh, but Mike, back over to you. Um, as you look to be the lender, in some cases of last resort, and to fill in the funding gap that's been left by the regional banks, where are you stepping in? Where are you seeing the best opportunities across sectors, uh, across different companies? The assets are performing. Hotels are great. Multifamily is great, industrial is great, all the, all the things that Hugh pointed out. Um, this is really more about fixing you know, over levered properties and, and just getting through that correction process on price. But where we're trying to take the most advantage is you know, where the banks have stepped back the most. So we, we talked earlier about banks being about 50% of the overall credit market. They represented probably about 95% of the construction loan market. So we've seen the construction lending market come to a virtual standstill. And we've been trying to take advantage of that, lending mostly, I would say, in multifamily uh, and also in, in some industrial construction, but uh, writing what we believe to be some of the best risk adjuster returns in construction lending that we've seen since the GFC. Right, right. Uh, that's a significant opportunity to step in. Uh, my last question to both of you, um, you know, when we take a step back and reflect back again on 2023, um, everybody knows this again, that it's been a very slow fundraising year. You know, if you look at the fund flows into commercial real estate funds, uh, we've had the slowest year of fundraising since uh, 2013, so in 10 years. So Hugh, my question to you is, when is the time you think that investors are going to say, you know what, I want to re-engage with the asset class, or when do you think they should? So um, I think that is actually starting now. And I have been surprised by the volume of interest from investors in doing underwriting and looking at real estate, private equity real estate products um, across the spectrum. So, um, and what we've seen uh, is institutional investors starting to do the work so that they are ready in the first couple of quarters of 2024 to re-enter the market. Um, it begins now. Mike, what do you say? Look, I, I think Hugh and I are both fundamental believers in the long-term investment of commercial real estate. There's going to be periods where equity outperforms credit, credit outperforms equity, and vice versa. The, the, the real goal here is to have the exposure to the asset class. It's a great diversifier. And as Hugh said at the very beginning, over the past four, five, six decades, it's really been a very stable performing asset class. 
and should continue to be in the future. Right. Uh, you know, thank you for your terrific insights on both sides of the equation. And what I especially liked about our conversation is that we did address not only the equity side of commercial real estate, but also the debt side. And if I'm an investor in commercial real estate market, I need to understand that I may have opportunities across that entire ecosystem, even if one part of it may not be most optimally positioned. And so, you know, my takeaway is, you know, Mike, as you say, you're stepping in and you're providing capital and you're seeing probably some of the best opportunities uh, or the number of opportunities that you've seen since the financial crisis, and that's terrific. Uh, and Hugh, um, it sounds like the valuation correction may be running its course and investors are looking to step in and buy some of those good properties at better prices. Uh, so with that, thank you both for your insights. Thanks for joining us today. Thanks, Anastasia. Thanks for having us. Thank you. March is Women's History Month, and I've invited iCapital Managing Director of Private Wealth Solutions, Corinne Salmon, to help us answer your question of the month. This one comes from John, who's asking, with markets at all-time highs, are we seeing other advisors adding more protection? Uh, so Corinne, thanks so much for being yeah. here, and you're a perfect person to talk to about that because you spend your day talking to financial advisors mm -hmm. and talking to them about what type of structured investment solutions uh, that are out there. And so what's your take? Uh, are we seeing more advisors asking for protection for their portfolios? Yeah, and I think that's a, a great question, Anastasia. And what I would say is there's a, a couple of different ways to answer that. but. My first answer would be yes, we are, uh, particularly in, in two structured investments. Um, one would be a short dated buffered note, right? So 15 months, 18 months, 21 months, typically with something like the S&P as the underlying. Right? And as you know, that's usually something that advisors use as an alternative to a direct investment. So you'd like to be invested in the market, but you also want some protection on the downside. Typically, I'd say, Anastasia, we see about a 10% hard buffer there. Yeah. Um, now we're definitely getting more inquiries for um, 15, even 20% hard buffers. Right. And that, of course, makes sense for a couple of reasons. You know, first of all, on average, as a lot of advisors know, you get something like on average a 5% pullback every quarter and on average a 10% pullback once a year. But this hasn't been an average year. This hasn't you know? been an average, you know, let's say uh, 15 months. And so the S&P rallied or the NASDAQ uh, rallied so sharply since October. So I think that's what's driving that interest for some additional protection. Definitely, I would agree with that. And so if you're going from a 10 hard buffer to a 15 hard buffer, you just have to remember you're willing to give up some on the upside, right? You're willing to give up some potential profits on the upside so that you have more protection on the downside. Right, and what's the other structure that uh, folks are interested in? Yeah, the other structure I would say are short to medium term income notes. Okay. So typically what we see there, Anastasia, is a 70-70, right? And simply what that means is you have 30% contingent protection on your coupon and you have 30% contingent protection on your principal. We are seeing advisors um, add about 10% to uh, the contingent protection on the principal. And what that does is it brings the coupon in about 60 to 75 basis points, right? So if you're getting at nine and three quarters on a 70-70, you're probably looking at about nine to nine fifteen on a 60-70. Right. So that really, to me, speaks to the appetite to kind of beef up the protection yeah. a little bit, right? Sure. So you're willing to give up a little bit of the coupon. You may be willing to, you know, set the cap a little bit lower to give yourself a little bit more wiggle room on the downside. Yeah. And so, but we're talking about buffers and we're talking about 10, 15% protection. Mm -hmm. uh, but I guess my question to you is, what level of protection do you think is needed right now? Yeah, so, um, I mean, that's obviously personal opinion for me. Um, I'd probably feel pretty comfortable with about a 15 hard buffer, I'd say. Um, do I think we'll have a, a big pullback? Probably not, but we are, you know, at all time highs here. So, and I would say, Anastasia, the wonderful thing about structured investments is no matter what your view, there is a structured investment out there for you. So. If you think that you know the market will continue to rip to the upside, let's show you something that has uh, robust upside participation and is uncapped. Right? Maybe you think that the market will be um, muted to range bound over the next 12 to 18 months. Okay, well then why don't we show you something that has a, a good chance of making money uh, if the market's up, if it's down, or if it's flat. 
Right. And, you know, some of it has to do with where the market ultimately goes, but the other part has to do with what exposures do you have, right? Yeah, so, for example, sure. you could have a client who has been sitting in cash and sort of missed this tremendous rally that we have, in which case you may want to try to play catch up and you want you may want to incorporate something that gives you that, you know, two or three times leverage on the upside. But then you may have another client who's done very well in the tech trade. Yeah. And now there is a real risk for a 10, 15% correction. So, you know, for that, you might want to replace some of that Delta One, you know, all in, all equity exposure with something buffered on the downside as well. Yeah. So, uh, Corinne, thank you so much for helping us answer the question and uh, a few more that were underlying that. Yes. So, thank you so much for having me. Thanks for joining. Uh, well, thank you, Corinne. And thank you, John, for your excellent question. I'm Anastasia Amoroso, and thank you for joining us today. We'll see you next time on Beyond 6040.